This is the king of beers. You see, as a lipidologist looking at that maltose in there, two molecules of sugar bound together, I'm immediately thinking triglycerides when I look at that. You know the term beer belly. I don't know, guys in bars seem to have that visceral fat down there. I guess that's where it came from. But, you know, when our cells, the hepatocytes, start metabolizing glucose and it goes through those various cycles that we all learned years ago, something called citrate comes out of that. And citrate can be a precursor for fatty acid synthesis, which is going to drive triglyceride synthesis. Triglyceride, commonly known as fat, is actually three fatty acids stuck on a three-carbon sugar called glycerol. And it's how we, the body stores energy. And storing a little bit of energy is good. We have powerful genes to make us store energy because when we evolved as a species, if you had some stored fat, you survived the famine as opposed to those who couldn't make triglycerides. They would never last the famine. Remember, we're only here to pro uh, propagate the species, and surviving famines means you could maybe go on to have some children. So you needed a little bit of triglycerides. The problem is when famines disappeared, and it probably correlates with the agricultural revolution and the eating more refined sugars where triglycerides started to occur at levels that they weren't supposed to historically. Very recently, a document from the American Heart Association called an optimal triglyceride level to be less than 100. Most lipidologists would probably think under 70 would have been a better choice. But I don't think the average physician is cognizant. They're seeing people with triglycerides of 150, 180, and they think they're normal, and they're not. And to end this story, if you have too much triglycerides fat in your liver, the liver is a smart organ. It doesn't want to keep the fat. It wants to send it to your fat cells. And the only way the liver can make that translocation of fat is to stick it inside a lipoprotein called the VLDL. So people who overdo carbs are going to have triglycerides in their liver. Their blood triglyceride might only be 100, 110, 120, not enough to scare the average doc and that liver is going to be producing these VLDL particles and when the VLDL delivers triglycerides to the adipocytes or a little bit to the muscles for energy that becomes your LDL particle which is now carrying cholesterol and if you're making too many LDLs they're going to wind their way in your artery wall so uh, that's what I see when I look at maltose and it's not much different if you look at 60 calories less because a calorie is not a calorie. Well, you still got the maltose. You still got it's still a carbohydrate. It's still doing everything Dr. Dayspring said. I, I'm going to add one thing to that. I actually don't think that this this evolving through feast and famine. Um, you can get through if you're 10 percent body fat and you weigh 150 pounds, you can last a month. Yes, I didn't mean you don't evolution need, wanted yeah. us to be 250 exactly, pounds. No, exactly. A little so, bit of non-visible fat would get you through the fat. A little bit of fat will get yes. you through anything. Um, this X, these huge fat deposits we end up catching are completely unfit. No other animal gets obese the way humans get obese. And so something in our diets is doing it. It's not just, and every animal goes through a period of famine. That's what winter is. That's why we have hibernators and migrators and hoarders, you know, they're all dealing with winter, just as we all did. Something's driving us to accumulate a lot of fat. And that's, the, that's when you get into, you know, the maltose. And an interesting story, back in the 1960s, there was a debate between two British scientists. One of them was arguing that sugar was the only problem. And the other, a fellow named Peter Cleave, who was a naval re British naval researcher, and Peter Cleave said, he actually testified in the U.S. Congress, and he said, look, I can, I can pick the 30 fattest people within a half mile from here, and not one of them is going to have a sweet tooth, but they're all going to be beer drinkers. You know, it literally makes you fat. It's fattening. It's not the calories. It's the effect of the maltose, of these glucose molecules, on your liver, on your insulin secretion. And in the side, I doubt if there's any physician in America who would know who Cleve is, but everybody knows who Ansel Keys is, the guy who said fat causes cholesterol, causes heart disease. Yeah. So there's some injustice there somewhere. There's a huge injustice. <laughs> um, Tom, do you ever drink red wine? 
Uh, listen, I'm from the part of New Jersey called Soprano Country. So, uh, <laughs> yes, I, uh, th th there's some grapes that are grown in Tuscany that I have a taste for. <laughs> Now, we've got to be careful with this one. This is a, this is a Christmas present for you. This is a, a Pinot from Arger Martucci. Costa Arger is a cardiologist we work with uh, closely, and he gives talks about red wine and the beneficial effects of uh, red wine on the heart. And so this is... Uh, you're our Christmas present this year. Well, how nice. And, and now I can say the truth, because I, I said, geez, uh, I'm married to an Italian. I live in Soprano country. We love Tuscany wines. We always have. But for the last two years, we've drank almost nothing but Pinot Noir. So uh, <laughs> it's going to get out now. <laughs> but, uh, you know, this healthy wine in the cardiovascular system, of course, has never been tested in a randomized, blinded trial, and never will be. I don't know what you'd use as a placebo. Uh, I will certainly tell you the American Heart Association does not recommend wine in any way to improve the cardiovascular system. The observational data would suggest a glass in a woman or two in men. Uh, hey, they do better, but observational data is at best hypothesis generating data. So I certainly never recommend to a patient to solve their cardiovascular system with wine. First of all, it's just uh, there's a lot of calories in there that they probably don't need. Uh, whatever phytochemicals might be in there that might be good or who knows, there are probably other ways of obtaining them. So can't recommend it for the heart less sugar than white wines. So that's why they're not as sweet as white wines. So again, historically, physicians who have been wise enough to prescribe carbohydrate-restricted diets and sugar-restricted diets would allow a little bit of red wine rather than white wine. So in that sense, uh, but not because it's got any magical properties or resveratrol or, the, Correct. you know, be, but because it's a relatively low sugar. Um, and let me put one other and myth it's to rest also. It is certainly not recommended by any serious lipidologist involved in the studies of high-density lipoproteins to raise HDL cholesterol. First of all, raising HDL cholesterol has never been a proven methodology to reduce heart disease. And certainly that method of raising HDL cholesterol uh, is silly. Yet doctors frustrate it when they see low HL cholesterol, often because they don't really know what it means, think they have to raise it. Even though it's not a specific goal of therapy in the NSEP guidelines, they often turn their patients on to way more alcohol than they should use. And it's very interesting uh, epidemiologic data from Russia uh, where as HL cholesterol goes high, 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 mortality goes up. And how do, why do a lot of Russian men have such high HDL cholesterol? This is the vodka. <laughs> so uh, don't uh, recommend wine to raise, a, or any alcohol to raise HDL cholesterol. It's not part of anybody's regimen. Interestingly enough, uh, Pinot Noir has twice the amount of resveratrol that other red wines have. Uh, but of course the amount is like four milligrams. Uh, and they, they recently had a thing where they gave people 150 milligrams and of resveratrol and it Im allegedly improved uh, insulin resistance. However, the research was done by the guy that sold resveratrol to whatever drug company for $750 million. So, oh, right. yeah, they did very well in the resveratrol stuff, and they've had a lot of trouble confirming the results. Even in rats, it's hard to show that resveratrol really does anything. I do like Pinot the Wild, though. So. Uh, so Tom, that's your Christmas present. Now, Gary. That's mine. This is your Christmas present. This is it's a smaller an bottle. example. Yeah, this is a <laughs> half a pint of uh, Two Fingers Tequila, just to bring out the discussion of hard liquor. Um, you know, this is getting beyond my area of expertise. So, again, the question with alcohol, I mean, the alcohol is also metabolized by the liver. And you can't very, there's actually no obvious difference between non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and alcoholic fatty liver disease. The way the doctor knows the difference is they ask the patient how much they drink, and if the patient says he drinks a lot, it's non-alcoholic. It's alcoholic fatty liver disease. Um, fatty di liver disease, again, seems to be related to insulin resistance. You've got the triglyceride accumulation. Is it coming from the alcohol itself? 
And if the Russians have a lot of fatty liver disease, I would answer that question right <laughs> yeah. there, because they they're not <laughs> drinking the vodka with mixers. No, yeah. uh, very interesting, though. Again, as a lipidologist, anything I look at, I'm relating it to lipids. And certainly one of the first pieces of advice we give to our patients who do have triglyceride abnormalities is they have to cut the alcohol. Because not in everybody, but in many patients, uh, triglyceride levels will soar with alcohol. And there is evidence that alcohol disrupts some of the oxidative enzymes in mitochondria that perform beta oxidation of fatty acids. And if you can't oxidize your fatty acids, they are a substrate to keep triglycerides going. If you so. can't burn them for fuel, Correct. to use these simplistic... Oxidize, to, to me, is burned to Gary, and he's yeah. right. So It's interesting, the... Uh, one of the uh, YouTube videos that's been very popular out here and a number of people coming to the uh, conference tonight have looked at it. It's uh, a friend of yours, Dr. Uh, Lustig from uh, UCSF, and he talks about uh, uh, fructose being metabolized like alcohol. He says uh, fructose is alcohol without the buzz. And uh, that's the kind of message we look for to give to our police officers or firefighters so they have something they can hang their head on. It's, it's almost like uh, it's not the passengers, it's the cars. We look for messages like that. I just read a paper yesterday by French researchers also pointing out in their studies, um, sugar was more addictive than cocaine. So, I mean, there's a reason why we like, there's a reason why we come to perceive any food with sugar as a food that's pleasing and that satisfies us where foods without sugar don't. And, uh, you know, whether that's in the brain or in the body is hard to say, but certainly there's a, there's a large effect in the brain. That's why I especially like my tequila in a margarita. <laughs> yeah, and I drink it straight because I'm a purist.